Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're going to be taking a look at how to configure advanced configuration of Marlin firmware version 2.0. This is going to be applicable to basically everyone with a 3D printer because it's going to be useful for anyone looking to either upgrade original printers with new firmware, making changes or modifications to your printer that require changes to the firmware, or building a printer from scratch. Anything that requires firmware modification will be covered here. Firstly, there are two previous episodes to this that you may want to watch before watching this one. Those got us started with VS Code and Platform IO, getting everything installed and ready to start working on. And the second episode covered the whole basic configuration of Marlin firmware. So that config.h file, the basic configuration, is all covered. Not every single detail, but again, the most popular features were covered in that. So once you've done those, you're probably looking to do some more advanced configuration, which is what we're going to be covering today. And that's going to be in the config underscore adv.h file. A number of settings in here can cause damage to your printer if they're not handled correctly. So before making any changes, make sure you understand these features as much as you can and always monitor your printer when it's printing or even in the setup and programming to make sure there's nothing going wrong based on a setting that you might have typed incorrectly. Just be careful, basically. The advanced configuration file is no shorter than the basic configuration file. In fact, it is longer. So instead of trying to cover every single part of this 2000 line document in 10 or 15 minutes, we're going to look at the most common features. Well, things that I predict will be the most common because I have no data on what's actually most common. But things like Trinamic TMC stepper driver configuration, how to set up steps per millimeter, not steps per millimeter, number of micro steps, and also the stepper current and maybe how to do IDEX and things like that. These more advanced things that take a little bit more in depth and we'll look at how you set them up, the parameters you need, and maybe how you can get to those figures that you actually need for your specific printer. So with that all said and done, I think we're ready to get into the config. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to be looking at is one of the thermal settings, and that's custom thermistors. A custom thermistor could be something you need to specify if you don't find something in the standard selection. So in config.h, where we selected a thermistor and appointed it to each of the different areas where we're measuring temperature. If you can find in the list the specific thermistor that you're using, then you can use the value of 1000 to specify custom parameters in config.h. Oh, well, config underscore adv.h. So this is where we do that. You have to specify individually for each temperature sensor, whether it's a nozzle or bed or chamber. And there's three values that you need to do that the pull-up resistor, the hot-end resistance at 25 degrees Celsius, and the beta value. The beta value is basically a parameter that determines the curve, so the relationship between temperature and resistance. If you're looking for a more permanent solution, you may want to add a thermistor table, which you can find under Marlin, SRC, module, and then thermistor. From there, you can assign a new number as well as the table and therefore basically setting up a new thermistor in Marlin. The next feature I want to try and explain is extruder cooling fans and auto temperature fans. So this is where a fan will automatically turn on based on a specific temperature. And those temperatures are generally based on things that are deliberately heating up, such as the extruders or chamber. In order to enable this feature, you need to determine a few parameters. The first being the pin on which you want to enable the fan. So for each of the extruders, which you may have enabled, you'll need to specify a specific pin for that fan. In this case, I've set pin PE5 to be enabled alongside extruder E0. So this is the first extruder and only extruder on my machine. In order to find out the pin number that you need to be enabling, you need to check out the pins for your board. So up here, I have a tab open for the Big Tree Tech GTR version one. And on the side, you can see the location for that. So if you want to find it, it's from under Marlin, source, pins, and then you need to just find the type of processor which your board is using. And here I can find mine. Now by default, there's a lot of fans enabled on this board as there are a lot of fan pins. Initially, this was fan one pin was PE6. I've moved that up and taken PE5 to use in here. You could use any of these pin numbers which are allocated to fans to go onto any of these if you had multiple extruders. In my case, most of these are disabled because I don't have many 
fans that I need to be controlling. Once you've specified the pin number to use, you also need to determine the temperature at which is going to be enabled, and that's in Celsius. So this will turn on when extruder naught, or technically I suppose the hot end, reaches 50 degrees Celsius, and it will come on at full speed, so 255. You can set this to anything between 0 and 255, although if you set it to 0, obviously, it won't turn on. This temperature is set for all of the extruders at the same time, so obviously they'll only turn on individually when they each reach that temperature. You can't have a different temperature for each one. For the chamber, you can allocate a separate temperature and a separate fan speed. Just below the fans, we have the case light. So where you don't have an actual case, this can just be a light on the printer, which enables you to see a little bit more of the print. Unfortunately, in my case, the print light is directly above the extruder, so it actually casts a shadow on the print. It's okay for larger prints, you can still see most of it, but for printing small things, it's not particularly helpful. Either way, this is where you can enable the case light. So obviously to turn it on, you need to remove the comment from the define case light enable. And then there are a couple of parameters you need to set. So first, obviously, you need to set the pin again, just like with anything else. And I've decided to use a pin from the fans again. So I've taken the pin number from fan two. As you can see, I wrote myself an additional comment disabled in order to use case light fan. So I've disabled fan two and I'm going to use that pin number for this. So that means the plug, the plug location that's labeled on the board as fan number two can be used for the light. The reason this works is that LEDs are not going to be drawing a lot of power and it can be similar or maybe probably slightly more power draw than a fan, but it's generally suitable for both cases. You can switch the light logic so if it's off when it should be on and on when it should be off, you can switch that between true and false in order to invert it. If you want the light to be off by default instead of on, again, you can switch between true and false. Personally, I want the light to come on as soon as I turn on the printer and to just stay on, so I'm going to keep with that. The brightness, typically I don't want my LEDs to be running at 100% brightness. They just end up using quite a lot of power and heat in the generation of that. And I don't need it to be that bright. I just need to have some lighting around. As with other PWM controls, you can set this between 0 and 255. I've set mine around 100, so that's somewhere in the 40% region. Additionally, you can enable a case light menu, which I'm going to do as well. What this will do is give me an option in the LCD menus that will allow me to change the brightness of the LED. This can be really useful when setting up because it means if you're not sure what value to put for brightness, you just enable the menu, change it to be what you want and read off what the value is and you can stick it back into the firmware if that's what you want to do. If you don't have any PWM control so you're not able to set the brightness like this, then you can disable no brightness to remove the PWM control. And lastly, if you want to use NeoPixels for an RGB setup so you could set PWM values for each red, green, blue, and white, then you can do that here as well. So next we have dual steppers and dual end stops. This is where you have two individual stepper drivers driving two individual stepper motors, but both for the same axis of movement. If on some boards you have two stepper motor outputs from a single driver, then you don't need to use this feature. Likewise, you can't use this feature if you need to rotate two stepper motors in two directions from one stepper driver. This feature I would say is most commonly used for dual Z motors as it's quite often the most common thing to be technically missing from a low cost setup and is fairly easy to add. Control boards such as the ramps always came with an extruder 0 and extruder 1 and quite often would only use single extruder so the second extruder output could be used for a second Z motor that could rotate in any direction and use an independent end stop. As I've mentioned, this feature isn't just for dual X or dual Y. In fact, you can use it for up to four stepper drivers on the Z axis. And this will enable independent rotation of each of those Z motors. And that level of control can allow you to do complex leveling using multiple stepper motors and actually getting true leveling of the bed as opposed to software compensation. So to set this up, hey, you obviously need to remove that comment to enable dual stepper drivers for that specific axis that you're using. And then if you need to invert the direction, so if they're either going in opposite directions and need to go the same or are going the same and need to go opposite, you can use that logic. If you also want to use dual end stops, so stay, say you're using two Z motors and you want that whole axis, the X axis that's riding up and down on a Z motor, to be leveled to the bed as a result of using two end stops, you can have one end stop at 
control one motor and another end stop control the other Z motor. Obviously we're doing X here, but the feature's the same. If you have two end stops, you can control those two motors independently when they're homing. I'm actually not going to be using this feature, so I can comment that out. But that's where it is if you'd like to use it. A little bit further down, we have what's known as IDEX or a dual X carriage mode. This is where you have two carriages on your X axis that can both move independently of each other. That's where IDEX comes from, independent dual extruders. So each of these has its own hot end and they park at their respective ends. One goes to the left, one goes to the right or min and max. So you need to determine what those parameters are in order to stop those things colliding. So as always, if you want to use IDEX feature, you obviously need the mechanics to deal with that. But you also need to obviously enable the feature in the firmware. And then there are, of course, as always, a number of settings. So the X min position is the min position where you're homing. The max position of the first carriage is the bed size. And then you need to add some dimensional parameters in order to prevent the two carriages from basically hitting each other. So this is going to be approximately the width of your first carriage. And this is going to be the distance between the two nozzles when they're both homed. Your home direction of your second carriage is always going to be to maximum, where your X1, your other carriage, your first carriage, is always going to home to the minimum. So these parameters are here basically to ensure that A, the two carriages home to their correct respective locations, and that they know the bounds of their movement in order to prevent them from colliding with each other. As we're traveling past it, I thought I'd mention now the Z stepper auto align feature. So where you can use multiple Z stepper motors to enable basically bed leveling or true bed leveling, if you like, by changing the stepper motors slightly different heights to make sure that the nozzle is perpendicular to all areas of the bed. You can do that here. There are a number of parameters which you need to set. I'm not going to go through those though today. Carrying on down to line approximately 1465, we have a feature called baby stepping. You may also know this as live Z adjust if you're used to using Prusa machines. Baby stepping is a feature where you can have very small offsets from your homing or probe values in order to refine the distance between the nozzle and the bed. This can be very useful for doing very small adjustments after an auto homing feature. Typically, you would just enable this on your Z axis, but you can see here, you can enable this on X and Y axis as well, if that's what you want to do, but not on a Delta machine. Almost forgot, obviously, you do need to enable the feature first by removing the comment on the defined baby stepping. If your baby steps are going the wrong way, you can invert them, changing false to true. The multiplicator will increase the size of your baby steps by this factor. By default, they are very, very, very small. Even changing this for quite a while with rotation of the dial will not really get you very far. So I use a multiplication factor of 50 and that seems about right. It's perhaps still a little bit on the small side so I might increase this with a little bit more testing. But this is where you can change basically how big those steps are with each turn of the dial. And there's a separate multiplicator if you want to use baby steps on X and Y. If you want to have a quick access for Z baby stepping from the main status screen menu, then you can enable double click for baby stepping. So double clicking the click wheel will allow you to get there very quickly. You can also enable a display total on the screen for your baby steps since the last G28 command. Next up, we're taking quite a large jump down to line 1916 where the TMC section starts. So if you're using trinamic TMC stepper drivers that have specific features that you want to be able to tune, then this is the place to do it. Firstly, in general for stepper motors, you can have a hold multiplier and interpolation value. So the hold multiplier will reduce the current to the motor when it's just staying in its current position. In other words, there's no acceleration, so it doesn't need to apply large amount of force, so it can reduce the current to reduce the heating and reduce the power usage. Interpolation is where you can basically convert a 1 16th microstepping to 2 56th microstepping using the stepper driver itself. In my case, I'm going to turn this off and so I've put it on default. But if you have other boards, maybe you're using an 8 bit board which doesn't support 256 native stepping, you can enable this, so set that to true, and that will allow some interpolation of the steps up to 256. 
Once you've decided those, you can move on to deciding the currents and micro steps for each of your axes. The current value is something which you would want to calculate. So by taking your peak current and multiplying it by 0.7, you can achieve approximate value for what your maximum current should be. What I would also recommend though is not going higher than you actually need to, just because it overheats the stepper motors and it will reduce their life. You can keep a fairly low current on things that are moving very low masses, but you, if you have, for example, a NEMA 17 driving a very large heated bed like I am, then you will need to increase that current in order to prevent any skip steps in the motor. Because the current in the motor, the amount of power, the amount of current, will determine its holding torque or its ability to, it's basically how strong the motor is. The more current, the stronger it is, the faster it can accelerate and the greater it will resist a load during an acceleration. You can also set a different current for homing. So if you just want to home at a low current, then you can do that. I believe this will also help with electrical noise during the homing process for your probes, but I'm not 100% certain on that. So don't quote me on that one. Micro steps will tell you how many micro steps you want to use. Obviously, if this is enabled on true, then this will be at 16. But for me, I'm going to use the 256 full micro steps for every axis that I'm going to enable. So you'll probably want to enable this for all of the stepper motors that you have enabled. So they'll all be lit up because you'll have uncommented them elsewhere. This TMC section also includes the stealth chop feature. And fortunately, there's no configuration for this that you need to do. So if you want to enable stealth chop for your X and Y or Z or E stepper motors, you can do that simply by removing the comment. Note, as always, this is only applicable for a set number of stepper drivers. If you have drivers which are not these, you won't be able to use this feature. In my case, I'm actually not going to be using it, so I'm going to leave that removed for now. Just below the TMC section that we were just looking at, there's a separate one called Stool Guard 2, which is for homing. So this is better known maybe as sensorless homing. Stool Guard is basically a feature which allows the stepper motor to feedback to the processor, the main controller on the board, the amount of force it's currently applying. And so when it hits a hard stop, that will peak very quickly. And that tells the, well, this kind of special software feature that it's hit the home position. As you can see, there are limitations on which TMC stepper drivers are enabled for using this feature. If you don't have one of the ones enabled in the list, you will not be able to enable this feature. So if you want to be able to use this feature, make sure you use one of these stepper drivers, which is listed here. I'm using TMC 2209s, so I could use Stoolguard 2 if I wanted to, but at the moment I've configured it to use end stops because they were already there and I thought I might as well. In general, Stoolguard 2 can be a little bit less accurate than using physical end stops. So in general, although it can be a lot easier to use, it may not be necessarily better. Also, I wouldn't recommend using for the Z-axis just because you have a bit of a risk of damaging the bed. I personally wouldn't want to risk that. So I would generally stick with probes and other sensing methods for the bed. To enable senseless homing, as always, you can just remove the comment by the fine and that will enable senseless homing. Once you've enabled the feature, you will need to configure the sensitivity appropriately to make sure it triggers at the right point, not too early and doesn't just ram into the axis without triggering. I'm not going to be using sensorless homing, so I'm going to keep that disabled for now. Okay, so hopefully that's been useful for everyone looking to do some advanced configuration of the Marlin firmware. Of course, if you've not seen the previous two videos, make sure you go back and watch those and do that setup and basic configuration before you get into the advanced stuff that we covered today. In the next video, we're going to look at how you can compile the firmware and we'll do a bit of troubleshooting on error messages that you may get when doing your compiling ready to upload to the printer which we will also cover in the next video so that's going to be it for me today thank you very much for watching and i will see you in the next one